continuing in the study of the book of Luke. We're not going in an order. We are just looking at different aspects of the book of Luke and have been doing so for quite some time now. But as we come to this passage of scripture this morning, you'll find it to be very familiar sounding. Uh, it is very similar, in fact, to the content of uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 that we know of as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there's reason to believe that it is only similar in content, but not the same account as the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 says, He went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. But then in Luke chapter 6, verse 17 up there, it says, And he came down with them and stood on a level place. You've got a lot of descriptive uh, differences there. Now, I just say that to uh, say that it doesn't matter. I understand that it's similar. Uh, but whether it's the same uh, event uh, or time that Jesus spoke or not really is immaterial. But just so you know that there is uh, reason to believe it could be that Jesus just taught the same way on different occasions. And that certainly would be easy to understand. At any rate, this is a very shocking passage of Scripture uh, to the world because Jesus switches the world's values completely around. What Jesus is saying is directly opposite of the way that the world thinks. It was, this, it was that way in his day. It is still that way to this very day. He totally rejects materialism, that is, the things, the thoughts, the ways of this world, and he warns those who are worldly and those who are materialistic. He warns them that judgment, severe judgment, is coming. And so I want to look at this passage of Scripture verses 20 to 26. We'll look at it in two segments this morning. The first thing that we see as we get into the message is that there is promises to those who reject materialism, those who reject the, the things, the thoughts, the ways of this world. Let's look first of all at verses 20 through 23. 20 through 23. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Now let's look at this passage here, this portion of this passage of Scripture. Uh, Jesus, again, is giving promises to those who reject the things, the thoughts, the ways of this world. The first thing that Jesus speaks of in verse 20, he says, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. Now, this does not mean that a person must be uh, in poverty or financially poor in order to be blessed. Jesus is not saying that at all. You see, those things are not pleasing to God, to be uh, without anything, to be poor, to be destitute, to be without uh, food, clothing, shelter, anything. Those things are not pleasing to God. So he's not talking about those particular things, especially uh, in the world of plenty in which we live. Uh, and he's talking about those who are poor in spirit. Now in Matthew chapter 5, in that account, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is saying the same thing here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? A person who is poor in spirit 
It means to acknowledge that the real blessings of life and the real blessings of eternity come only from a right relationship with God. I want you to understand, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's talking to followers of Christ. He's talking to believers. All right, so as Christian people, we can sit here today, and, and this message is to us. We claim to follow Christ. And so he's speaking to believers here. But a person who is poor in spirit, they acknowledge that the real blessings of life and eternity come from a, only from a right relationship with God. But also, uh, this means to acknowledge that no matter what a person has achieved, uh, in this world that is, uh, no matter what they have in this world, they are no better they are no richer, they are no more superior than the next person. We're not better than anybody. Now, some people act better than other people, but as far as people are concerned, we're no better than one another. And so that's uh, some of what it's talking about, to be poor in spirit. The opposite of being poor in spirit is to be full of self. I wonder, do we know people like that? No doubt every one of us know people like that. Now, when you ask somebody else, could they look at you that way? Could they look at me that way? And so Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. There is a promise to the poor in spirit and that promise is that the Bible says there, yours is the kingdom of God. Yours is. Not yours shall be someday, but yours is the kingdom of God. Now you'll find the translation kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, uh, they mean the same thing. Now when it says that, okay, I'm poor in spirit, so... Uh, my reward is the kingdom of heaven. That is now. What in the world does that mean? Well, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is revealed in four different stages throughout history. I'll make it simple this morning and address only one. There is a spiritual kingdom that is at hand. That is that it is present right now. Now, this refers to God's rule, reign, and authority in the lives of believers now. That is, you have the rule, the reign, the authority of God in your life right now. This present kingdom is offered to the world through the person of Jesus Christ. There is no other. Amen? The world still thinks that there are multiple ways to be saved, if you will, or to be right with God, or to go to heaven when they die. But there is only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. This present kingdom is, uh, furthermore, on that same point, experienced only by the new birth. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. And so there has to be a new birth experience in order for us to be a part of this present kingdom of God. The present kingdom of God is also a spiritual, life-changing blessing. The Bible speaks of it this way. It says that old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Based on what? Based on the fact that someone is in Christ. They've come to Christ as their Savior and Lord. But then Jesus goes on after he says, Blessed are the poor. He says, Blessed are the hungry, in verse 21. For you shall be satisfied or filled. Now, of course, this is a spiritual hunger. A spiritual hunger, a hungering after righteousness. 
I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I struggled all week on a, on a, for a number of reasons, but included in that was trying to get this sermon ready to preach. Dave, I wanted 500 people in here today after all I went through. Bless my little heart. And then I had the audacity, as some pastors do on occasion. We don't do it all the time. I'm sure Mike could witness this. But every now and then, you sure hope that some people are there that need to hear what you're going to say. And they ain't here. Aren't y'all glad you're here? Now, th those are just things that, that grind on, on pastors sometimes. We, 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 when we start talking about people having a hunger for righteousness, you see, the Bible, in the, when the Bible speaks of righteousness, it means two simple but very profound things. It means both to be right and to do right. Let me explain what I'm saying here. There are those who stress being righteous, but neglect doing righteousness. Now, who are those people that stress righteousness, but fail at doing righteousness? Those are the people that know all the rules and can tell you all about how you ought to live, and yet they won't look in the mirror at themselves. I wonder, do we know some of them people? A lot of people say preachers and pastors that way. Well, i got news for you. I'm on no better position than you are. But then... When we look at the Bible, the Bible knows nothing about being righteous without living righteously. You can't be one without the other. But then there are those who stress doing righteousness and neglect being righteous. Who are those people? Those are the people that think that they're good enough, and if they do enough good deeds, and if they join them a church somewhere, run through one side of a baptistry one way and out the other, and all of the good things that religious folks do, and they give to the worthy causes, and they do all the good things, they think somehow that will get them a place in heaven. I hope you hear today, every one of you know that that's not the case. On our best day, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are not good enough and never will be good enough. To be saved. We're saved by grace. And so back to this idea of having a, a hunger for righteousness. If we're not careful, if we stress doing righteousness and not being righteous, it leads to self-righteousness. It leads to legalism. It leads to being judgmental toward other people. I wonder, do we know some of those folks? And furthermore, I wonder if those folks know some of those folks. Then Jesus goes on to say, Blessed are those who weep and mourn, verse 21. He said, For you shall laugh. Now, here's another thing that, that really burdens my heart. We're talking about weeping over sin. There are some people in this world who weep all the time about this, 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 and all the other. Those are them folks, I've said it before, but, you know, you ask how you're doing, and... Ten minutes later, you were so sorry you ever asked. But this is not the kind of weeping and mourning that Jesus is talking about. 
He's talking about those who would weep over sin. It is a broken heart over evil and suffering. Does it break your heart when you look out at what people do in this world to get in trouble? You find where young teenagers are shooting people. You look at uh, young people, very young ages, who are, who are uh, all caught up in the drug wars and, the, uh, and all kinds of criminality, and you think, how do they get that way in such a short period of time? Does that break your heart? Or do you sit there and think, well, they got what they deserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it ought to break your heart that people are in those positions in life. It's not a funny thing. It is a sad, sad thing. Who are those who mourn? First of all, it is a person who has such a sense of sin around about them that their heart is just totally broken. It breaks my heart when I see people out in sin. It does. For a child of God, it ought to break our hearts when we see sin and its results. But also those who mourn, they are the, they are the, that's the person who feels the tragedies, feels the problems of the sinful behaviors of others. Your heart goes out to them. And we hear about people that they are what we refer to as repeat offenders. Too often we... We look at them and we just kind of brush our hands off and say, well, you know, they ought to know better. And we just pass it off like it's their problem. And no, I want to tell you, it ought to break our hearts to see that kind of thing. I didn't make this up. Jesus said it. He said, blessed are those who weep and mourn. He's talking about for people that are so broken over this kind of thing. I don't mean to preach to the choir. I do wish some of them other folks had been here today. Don't go they're gonna miss it. But you know what? I'm gonna tell you, and it's gonna be straightforward. I was told, by the way, to calm down a little bit. I'm sorry. I was supposed to be standing up here. With... Don't work. I don't mean to be cold and hard. Here, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Until the church starts getting real serious about this matter of sin around about us, we're not going to have revival. We are, in fact, going to die. We may have a full house, but we're going to be dead spiritually. That's just a fact of life. Until we realize what's going on around us and become saddened and burdened about those things, Instead of just passing it off like, well, maybe it'll work out someday. When was the last time you just bowed on your hands and knees before God and prayed for everybody else that's lost and undone? Or people that are saved and they're out of the will of God? Most of us too busy praying for our own selves. Jesus said a person needs to be one who weeps and mourns. He gives a promise to those who do such. And we read the word laugh in these in a, in a modern translation here, and it, uh, it, it, it kind of gives us this negative thing, because we think laughing means we're going to laugh at people, and at situations. That's not what he's talking about when he says that, that, that there's a promise that, that they should laugh. I have a picture. Uh, it's on 
on my phone somewhere way back up there a number of years ago. It was taken, really it's just kind of this random click, you know. Sometimes you get your best ones that way. And uh, the, the picture at the time really was just one of other pictures. But now it is a pic of mine. It's a blessing of mine. Because somehow in the snap of that thing on the phone, I got a picture of my mother and my father in the same shot. And we were in a room together at a Christmas gathering for our family. And my father is leaned all the way back, his mouth wide open, laughing. And my mom is sitting, whoops, my mom is sitting over there laughing as well. And you know what? They were, I don't know what it was about, but that is the most beautiful picture of just joy and happiness. And I wouldn't take anything for that one just random picture. It was a laughter. That it's, it's like what Jesus is talking about here. It's, it's from joy. It's from happiness. What, what uh, this, this laughter, this happiness or joy comes from two different things. First of all, it, it comes from seeing the end of sin, of shame of sorrow, of suffering, of tragedy. That's going to have to be a joyful time. Now, I don't want to upset anyone's theology on death and that kind of thing. I will tell you something. i got a mother and a father and a sister that are in heaven right now. And of course, grandparents and aunts and uncles and all that stuff. I said, I'm going to say, I know they're in heaven. Not because they're related to me, not because I like them real well, and not because they're family and just this, 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 this. No, because they put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only reason they're there. Fact is, they are in heaven. The Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So they're in the presence of Almighty God. I want to tell you something, and I'm so glad of this. People say, aren't you sad about your folks being dead and gone? Oh, no, they're not dead and gone. They're just moved off to glory. And that does not sadden me. I miss them. But another thing that I want to point out is the fact that they're in heaven today. They're not floating around on clouds looking down at this world. Do you realize that if you was in heaven and experienced the glory of heaven for one split second, anything that had to do with this world would be sad, and there is no sadness in glory. I'll just go a little further. You know, folks that have gone on to be with the Lord, they didn't get angels' wings either. So they're not flying around. You know, no, they're not angels. They're people that were saved, bought by the blood of Jesus. And when I think about the fact that they are past all of this sin and turmoil and strife and shame and all kinds of stuff, that brings joy to my heart. This laughter, this happiness, joy also comes from being comforted. There is a present comfort. It is a settled peace, a relief, a solace, a consolation within. It is assurance of forgiveness. It is assurance of being accepted by God. It is a fullness of joy in spite of what else is going on. It is a sense of God's presence and God's guidance in my life. That is a present comfort that we can enjoy now. But there's
there's also an eternal comfort, and that is there will be the passing from death to life. The Bible speaks of the wiping away of all tears. What a comfort that is as well. But let's move on further. Jesus also said in verse 22, Blessed are the persecuted for Jesus' sake. The persecuted are those who endure suffering for Christ. Not because they're jerks or whatever in this world. No, it's talking about those who suffer because they are uh, of Christ. Christ is in them, and they live out Christ in this world. Now, it means being hated and excluded. It means being reproached, having one's name spoken against. I've been there. As a pastor, pastor's wife, we, we've been there. You know, people will avoid Preachers, preacher's wives, you know. <laughs> Why? Because, so, you know, somehow they think we're their judge. You don't owe me anything. How you talk or how you act. I've had people cuss in my presence. Oh, preacher, I'm sorry. <laughs> don't bother me about it. I mean, thank you for showing some respect or whatever, but you owe something to God more than you owe it to me. But understand to some degree what it means to be excluded, to be avoided, left out, you know. And really it has little, if anything, to do with the fact that I'm saved, born again, bought by the blood of Jesus. It's because I'm the pastor. Now don't worry, and I'm not going to look at anybody in particular, but I've seen people in the grocery store run another way, you know. Maybe they got a wine bottle in their buggy. I don't care. I need to go to the grocery store and buy mine. Not my wine. My <laughs> I, got, I got more important things to do than to judge people on, their, on those things. Understand, I understand a bit of that. Believers suffer persecution because they're not of this world. Well, they, they're in this world, but they're not of the world. And the promise to the persecuted is twofold in verse 23. The persecuted receive great reward now. What is the great reward now? is that no matter how the world thinks about me, I, I would just sum it up by saying it's that peace that can't be explained. I've got a peace inside of me that can't explain it to you, but it's there, it's real. The promise also goes on to for the persecuted that they'll receive the kingdom of heaven, not only now, but eternally. Now, I want to look at the last part real quickly of this message, which has to do with the judgment of those who follow after these things. In your Bible, look at verses 24, 25, and 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you, and all people speak well of you, for so did their fathers do to the false prophets. First thing that Jesus addresses is the rich. There's a strong warning to the rich. Why are rich people warned? And let me say what rich is, in my opinion. And you can agree or not agree. It's not, you know. But I'm going to tell you who's rich. If you can put food on your table, a roof over your head, and you can meet the basic needs of life, and you have a little left over, you are rich. You are rich. And I'm going to tell you something. There are millions upon millions upon millions of people in this world 
they would look at you and you and you and you and you and you and me and say, those folks are rich. You know that? They would. You need to go to so need to go to a foreign country sometime. My first mission trip, one of the first things that amazed me uh, a bunch of years ago. Went out we went down to Jamaica. Jamaica's nice for, you know, the the uh, cruise ships and all, but it's a very little part of that place that's that nice. But it don't take long to get past all that and get out into the real deal. When those folks saw us, words out of their mouth literally was, here come the rich Americans. I overlooked that. Now Jesus addresses the rich. The reason that he does so is because there is a lure, there's an attraction, a, a force, a power. There's a pull that reaches out and can draw anyone who looks at or possesses wealth. And we all know that to be true. There's just that power that reaches out, a, a, a lure, an attraction. Now, wealth can create the big eye. Wealth can bring about position, position, power, recognition, on and on. And it can boost a person's ego, make a person feel that he or she is really in need of nothing. and in charge of everything and everybody. Wealth is to make one hoard, be a hoarder. Now the world is in desperate need. I don't have to tell you that today. People are starving, sick, unhoused, unclothed by the millions. And I, I, I don't have time to, to qualify everything I say. I understand that there's a a bunch of stuff out there, and you've got to be real careful. But the point I want to make is that there are some people that have to give and won't turn loose of one red cent for anything. Amen? Will not give to nothing. Well, it tends to make a person greedy for some unexplainable reason, aside from just our the nature of our sinful flesh. The more we get, the more we want. It happens. The more we get, the more we want. When we taste the things of this world, we become comfortable with these things. Then we tend to fear losing our things. speaks of a judgment of the rich. He says that your wealth is your judgment. That is, the wealth you have right now, that's it. What did Jesus say? And it seems like I go back to this about every other week. But Jesus said if a person gained the whole world and lose his own soul, what is, what's the profit? Jesus is saying all that you have, if that's what you, if, they, if that's your hope and and nothing else matters. That is your reward. But then Jesus says, uh, gives a, a strong warning to the full. Verse 25. Those are the ones who are filled with all the things that the world has to offer. And again, far too many church people like that. Far too many church people. We were talking this this morning, uh, some of us back there. And what a gossip session, by the way. But I don't, I don't know how you are, and I'm not making a judgment on this thing. But when I was growing up, we didn't go on vacation seven, eight times a year. My folks saved up all year long. We had us one trip, man, and my daddy was one of them kind. He wanted to go to the beach, all right but he wanted to leave on Monday and come back Wednesday. That didn't give you, but we hated that. 
invariably the, the, the middle day was the day it rained, you know? Now, I'm not, I'm not casting judgment on it. I think, okay, if you can do that, and that's, some, that's fine. But my goodness, people are filled with all that the world has to offer at the expense of being filled with things that God wants you to be filled with. In other words, it's not a right kind of hunger. We want more of the world than we do of the things of God. Jesus warns those who laugh now. They're laughing it up in this world. There's going to come a day when they're going to weep and mourn. The last warning is to the prideful and compromising. People want attention, they want position, they want praise, recognition, applause, and the world, uh, you know, honors such ambitions. The world will give all that to you. They speak well of those kinds of people. But Jesus said the false prophets were those whom the world spoke well of. They were false prophets. They coveted worldly recognition and honor, and they received it. But they did so at the expense of a heavenly recognition and honor. And I don't care what the rest of the world thinks of me as long as my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can look at me and truthfully say, well done, you good and faithful servant. I don't care if anybody pats me on the back or not, but if my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ could say those words to me, says I've, I've done something right. As we close today, back to this point I made earlier in the message, there are those who stress being righteous and neglect doing righteous. Feels like a point that we need to tune into for our final thought today. Those who know how everybody else ought to do, but they won't do themselves. Could that be us here today? And then there are those who stress doing righteousness and neglect being righteous. Trying your best to be good enough to be approved of by God. salvation is, there, there is no such thing. You notice, and I've said this one time several months back, I think, but have you noticed when you when you read on social media or you see on the news uh, some interviews or whatever, have you noticed that everybody that's dead and gone, they're in heaven? Have you ever noticed that? I got some very sad news. Not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody goes to heaven. A lot of people are thought to be in heaven because why? Because they were so good. They were so good. But if they did not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, the sad scriptural truth of the matter is they'll spend eternity in hell, not heaven. That ought to break Christians' hearts today. Has the Lord spoke to you in some of this today? If he has, let's get in earnest with God. It's five after altar, sit in one of these pews or where you're at, it doesn't matter to me, but if God has spoke to your heart, you shut out everything else and you say, God, I'm here, what do I need? Or God, I know what I need, I'm doing that, I'm committing myself to that right now, right here, right now. Let's get in earnest with God. Sam and would you come? Let's stand
stand together. Hymn number 300 this morning. 